Instead of laying before your readers this appropriate proof, you foully suppress it and quote only the introductory verse which you are pleased to hold up to ridicule. Quote, then shall he say unto those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Unquote. This you style a singular proof. But did you not know, my dear friend, that this is no proof at all? Was it ignorance, or was it a fraudulent design that induced you to represent it as a proof? Did you not know that it was only the introduction to a proof? That the proof itself was contained in the subsequent verses, which I have already quoted, but which you have disgracefully suppressed? You pretend to lay before the public the proofs which the divines have advanced in support of their paradox. Instead of this, you only bring forth two garbled texts in proof of the one part. The other part you leave entirely destitute of proof. Of the two texts you brought forward, the one you represent as quoted for a purpose quite the reverse of that which it was really adduced, the other you represent as a proof when it is only intro the introduction to a proof. Such management, needs no com such management needs no comment. The only observation I would make is that you acted wisely in concealing your name. To support their paradox, the divines produce a multitude of appropriate texts which the reader may consult at his leisure. That in action may be sinful and the neglect of it more sinful is a paradox consistent both with scripture and reason. Quote, the plowing of the wicked is sin, unquote. And yet I trust you will readily acknowledge that not to plow would be a greater sin. The conduct of Henry VIII in promoting the Reformation, considering the abominable motives by which he was actuated, was undoubtedly sinful. And yet, what Protestant will deny that his conduct would have also been sinful had he neglected to promote the Reformation? Jehu's conduct in cutting off the house of Ahab, because it proceeded from improper motives, was sinful. Yet had he disobeyed the divine command, his conduct would have been more sinful. Suppose a man sees his neighbor's house on fire and hates the family so much that he would gladly see them all consumed. There, being, however, in the house a person who owes him a sum of money, he assists in extinguishing the flames and rescuing the family from the devouring element. Considering the state of his mind and the baseness of his motive, is not his conduct sinful? And yet, to suffer the whole family to perish would be more sinful. May I not here exclaim in your own style, quote, How miserable is the situation of this poor man! If he quench the flames, it is sin. And if he do not quench them, it is a greater sin. Unquote. Quote, the sacrifice of the wicked, we are assured, is an abomination to the Lord. Unquote. And yet, had he neglected to sacrifice, he would have been guilty of a greater sin. In like manner, the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, and yet not to pray would be a greater sin. In your introductory sentence you say, quote, Perhaps he, the author, may venture to suppose that independent of the inconsistency which exists between it, the confession, and the word of God, it is many times inconsistent with itself, unquote. In reply to this, you will now permit me to say that perhaps I may venture to suppose that you are mistaken, unquote. As paradoxes appear to be the order of the day, let us advert to those of the Reverend Presbyterian. Whatever may be your inferiority to the Westminster divines in other respects, candor and justice oblige me to acknowledge that in writing, in writing paradoxes, excuse me, you are not, quote, behind the very chiefest of them, unquote. Those of the Westminster divines are easily solved, but the solution of yours, I am perfectly convinced, will baffle the ingenuity of all the philosophers and divines in the world. Compare with them Samson's riddle, compared with them, excuse me, Samson's riddle is not worthy to be named. Page 43, you assure us that, quote, if the General Assembly and seceders were to act up to the principles of their predecessors, covenanters would be punished as heretics, unquote. Now, my dear sir, as the predecessors of these two bodies were covenanters, were they to act up to the principles of their predecessors, they would be also covenanters. How then could covenanters be punished as heretics? Here is a paradox. Page 26, you inform us that the layman be orthodox in Ireland, that though, excuse me, layman be orthodox in Ireland, he would be a heretic in England. Now, my dear, my dear sir, every schoolboy who has read a little geography knows that the established religion of England and Ireland are the same. How then could layman be orthodox in Ireland and a heretic in England? Another paradox. 
Same place you assure us that, quote, layman, if a seceder, would be banished from the United Kingdom by the Solemn League, unquote. Now, my dear sir, if seceders swear and subscribe the Solemn Covenant, how is it possible that by the same League they should be banished from the United Kingdom? Another paradox. Most extraordinary and paradoxical covenants, to be sure. Those who believe them would be punished by them, and those who do not believe them would be punished by them. Those who subscribe and swear them would be punished by them, and those who do not subscribe and swear them would be punished by them. Seceders would be punished by them, covenanters would be punished by them, and all others would be punished by them. Diabolical covenants, indeed. No wonder they were burned by the hands of the common hangman. Page 36, you assure us that the covenants and confession are inseparable. How then were they separated by the Synod of Ulster? How were they separated by the General Assembly of Scotland? Another paradox. Without mentioning any more of your paradoxes, perhaps I might now venture to suppose that independently of the inconsistence of your sentiments with the Word of God, they are many times inconsistent with themselves. I am, sir, notwithstanding your sincere friend, and paradoxical correspondent, etc. Letter 8 My Reverend and Dear Presbyterian, It would not be doing justice to your talents and ingenuity to pass unnoticed your lu lucubrations on covenants, covenanters, and seceders, etc., with regard to covenants, you express yourself thus, quote, If our forefathers, instead of composing leagues and covenants and swearing to them, had bound themselves to spread the scriptures by the gentle arts of persuasion under the protection of the civil magistrate, you must grant that they would more readily and rapidly have melted down oppression from amongst themselves and persecution from amongst their enemies, unquote. Pray, sir, how could our forefathers have bound themselves to spread the scriptures but by a league and a covenant? The paragraph, when analyzed, will read thus. If our forefathers, instead of binding themselves by leagues and covenants, had bound themselves by a league and a covenant, etc. After reading an observation so sagacious and sensible, can any person doubt your qualifications for discussing the subject of leagues and covenants? I confess, however, that notwithstanding the flood of light you pour all around you, there is not one difficulty still rests upon my mind. It is to ascertain... Uh, there is one difficulty still rests upon my mind, excuse me. It is to ascertain whether the Reverend Presbyterian be not himself a kind of mongrel covenanter. To covenants binding to spread the scriptures, you seem to have no dislike. On the contrary, you seem to approve of them highly. Now, sir, were you to enter into a covenant to spread the scriptures, do you not now that you would be a, uh, do you not now know, excuse me, that you would be a covenanter? You appear to hesitate. When Covenanter observes, quote, You are such an advocate for the gospel alone that you would refuse, I plainly see, to sign them, the covenants, or swear to them in any case, unquote. Quote, That I cannot tell, unquote, says the Reverend Presbyterian. You appear to doubt whether in any case you would become a Covenanter. In clearing this doubt, perhaps you could I could assist you a little. Excuse me. Page 43. You assure us that the ministers of the Church of Scotland swear and subscribe every article of the League and Covenant. In this sentence, sir, there is a slight inaccuracy. I mean that what you have asserted is not matter of fact. It happens that the ministers of the Church of Scotland neither swear nor subscribe one single article of the League and Covenant. No matter you thought they did. For I am sure you would not willfully publish a falsehood. You thought that the ministers of the Church of Scotland swear and subscribe the League and Covenants. In other words, you thought they were Covenanters. Now, my dear sir, when you were exerting yourself to obtain a union with these ministers, did you not think that you were about to become a Covenanter? Why, then, do you not join the Irish Covenanters? It cannot be lucrative motives that prevent you, for you assure us, quote, that the foundation of your loyalty is not founded on the countenance of government, unquote, much less can we suppose that, quote, the foundation of your religion is founded on that countenance, unquote. Perhaps you will allege that the true reason why you give a preference to the imaginary covenanters of the General Assembly is that though they swear and subscribe the same standards, yet with them they are in a, a great measure dead letters. 
that this is actually the case, you assure us, page 26. Now, sir, if this be so, why do you censure covenanters and seceders? Because with regard to section... Uh, with regard to a section or two of the Confession of Faith, there is a slight diversity of opinion, and because the subscribers explain the sense in which they understand these sections. To me, I confess such a mode of proceeding appears quite candid and fair. You think otherwise. You express yourself thus, quote, For I do assure you that society is now fully persuaded from experience that neither covenanters nor seceders are too honest or too holy, and that subscription to the whole doctrines contained... In the Confession of Faith, larger and shorter catechisms often turns out a rope of sand which they can snap at pleasure, unquote. All very good. But pray, sir, what do you think of the honesty and holiness of the General Assembly of Scotland? If your account of them be true, they swear and subscribe the Confession and Covenants and afterwards allow them to remain in a great measure dead letters. Could a more infamous banditti be found on the face of this earth then you have represented the General Assembly, a banditti of perjured villains who are no way influenced by oaths or subscriptions, who trample underfoot the most solemn obligations. Now, sir, if covenanters and seceders have a right to be stigmatized as dishonest and unholy because they subscribe a few sections of the Confession and Covenants in a qualified sense, must not the General Assembly, upon your own principles, be ten thousand times more dishonest and more unholy? And yet, strange to tell, dishonest and unholy as they are, you courted their fellowship, still stranger to tell. Dishonest and unholy as they are, you considered themselves, uh, excuse me, dishonest and unholy as they are, they considered themselves too honest and too holy to admit you into their communion. Their language to you was, quote, stand by thyself. Come not near us, for we are holier than thou. Unquote. But again, do you really imagine that the two presbyteries of the Synod of Ulster, that according to your own account, use the confession of faith, quote, in such a qualified manner as to render it a mere name, a piece of appearance? Unquote? Do you really imagine that these two presbyteries have much the advantage of covenanters or seceders in point of honesty or holiness? Ye seceders and covenanters, ye Christians of every denomination, Come see the zeal of the Reverend Presbyterian for honesty and holiness. In him contemplate a perfect paragon of candor and impartiality. Page 26, you say, quote, Let any humble Christian compare the acts and testimonies of seceders and covenanters, and then let him judge as to the harmony and uniformity which are brought about by adhering to the same human confession, unquote. Here I am convinced both seceders and covenanters should plead guilty. They have not, on all occasions, treated each other with that meekness and gentleness which becomes disciples of the meek and lowly Redeemer. The only legitimate conclusion, however, which follows from this, is that creeds and confessions go only a certain length in producing peace and concord. They do not eradicate all our corruptions. They do not render men absolutely perfect. The objection, however, would prove too much. It would prove that the scriptures themselves are only an imposture, for these sacred oracles do not produce universal peace and harmony, because perfect harmony cannot be attained by all the means we can possibly employ. Is this any reason that no means at all should be used for obtaining so desirable an end? Surely not. That the controversial writings of seceders and covenanters published fifty or a hundred years ago should not participate a little of the spirit of those times is not very strange. It is hoped, however, that the candid inquirer will judge of their spirit and temper by their modern productions. Let any unprejudiced person consult, quote, a short account of the old dissenters, unquote, and, quote, an explanation of the defense of their terms of communion, unquote, both published by the Reformed Presbyterian Scotland. Let him also consult the act and testimony published by the Covenanting Church in America, Reed's pamphlet against Fletcher and Longmore's pamphlet against the Covenanters, and then let him say, if they do not breathe the manly, but at the same time, mild and candid spirit of the gospel.